Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our October monthly webinar. Thank you all for joining us. We're looking forward to an interesting discussion today in what are the best practices in conducting writing workshops with Catch the Next author mentor Sergio Troncoso. I just want to remind everyone quickly that all attendees do come to the webinar muted. If you have a question during the presentation, please feel free to type it in the questions or the chat pane and I will read it during the Q&A period. Um, and, and if during the Q&A period itself, if you have any questions, you can use the hand raise feature and I will unmute you. Um, or if you are finding that you don't have audio, you can certainly type your questions there and I will read them for you. Remember that after the, after the presentation and Q&A, we will begin the Catch the Next member college reports. At this time, we will keep everyone unmuted and we want to encourage those of you who might have advice for any college to join the conversation. Since everyone's microphone will be unmuted, we just ask that you please be mindful of any ambient noise on your end that might interfere with those delivering their reports. And without further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Sergio Troncoso. Troncoso is the author, I'm going to read your bio real quick. Uh, Sergio Troncoso is the author of The Last Tortilla and Other Stories, Crossing Borders, Personal Essays, and the novels The Nature of Truth and From This Wicked Patch of Dust. He co-edited Our Lost Border, Essays on Life Amid the Narco Violence. Troncoso, Troncoso has taught writing workshops at the Yale Writers Conference in New Haven, Connecticut, and the Hudson Valley Writers Center in Sleepy Hollow, New York. He is a member of the Board of Counselors and an officer of the Texas Institute of Letters. Recently, he has served as one of three national judges for the Penn Faulkner Award for Fiction and as a final judge in the essay category for the New, New Letters Literacy Awards. And all right, Sergio, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you, Lydia. I uh, hope everyone can hear me. Um, so I prepared some remarks about the uh, the best practices in conducting uh, writing workshops. And they're going to go about 30 minutes or so, maybe 35 minutes. And, and then I'll open it up for questions. Uh, so we should have plenty of time for, for questions and, and an exchange. And so one of the things I wanted to do was to um, talk about, um, I divided my remarks into obvious goals and not so obvious goals of a writing workshop. Um, and these these goals and, and, and sort of rules and things that I do as a teacher to really create a unique and I hope great experience uh, at Yale and the Hudson Valley Writers Center. It's been through years of practice, years of trying different things, and every year I, I try to adapt a little bit more uh, given what I've learned. So, of course, um, you know, some of the, uh, and so anyway, so I hope that some of these you can adapt to your own um, for your own workshops with your own students. And I find that every single either nonfiction or fiction workshop that I teach is a, a little different. And so I've, I've had to adapt on the fly and these, these goals help me do that. So um, one of the obvious goals of a writing workshop, I think, uh, the ones certainly that the students uh, think about, uh, and I typically have uh, 10 to 12 students and I limit their um, manuscript that they turn in to me to review and for and to be reviewed by them as well to about 5,000 words which is about 20 uh, typed uh, pages and um, so that's that's what the students typically are focused on that's the obvious goal they they want their manuscript to review they want feedback on their work and and it doesn't really matter whether it's an essay or it's a short story because I've taught both short stories and and and, and nonfiction essays, as well. Um, and the and so I try to set the tone before I ever meet the students. So typically about two to three, sometimes four weeks before I give them a specific deadline to turn in their manuscripts, and um, they um, they turn them in to me as a word file um, in uh, through email. And, and so you set the tone as an organized workshop and I give them, um, not only are they supposed to turn in the manuscript to me, but I also give them a lengthy um, email telling them how they are supposed to start fashioning their critiques um, that they have to give their colleagues. And uh, they have to um, 
create these one to two page critiques and staple them to the back of the manuscripts before they even walk into the workshop. And I'm doing the same thing as well. And so the so that's the obvious goal, and that's what most students are focused on. I think um, the not so obvious goal, even before you start, is that you really have to set the tone to be serious about writing and, and provide strict guidelines and specific questions to be answered in their critique of others, because often people don't know what to focus on. Uh, how do you focus on characterization? How do you focus on setting? How does a plot not seem logical? Uh, what are some of the questions you should address in your critique? And so all of these I provide in an email once I receive their manuscript, and then I kick all the manuscripts back to them, and they have them ready to start reading um, their, their colleagues' work. Um, so the other thing I've, I've done before I even start, and I, I at, at this point have developed dozens of exercises, is I have these little mini exercises on point of view, for example, on voice, on setting for a purpose, uh, giving descriptive uh, exercises, on characterization. Uh, I also shared with the Cat to Next Wave teachers when they came up to Yale an exercise on looking at first sentences, for example in which I, I, I have uh, probably examples of 30 different first sentences from novels and also from um, nonfiction memoirs and how to dissect each sentence for tone, for point of view, for um, grammar, for uh, the usage of nouns, the usage of verbs. And this is very laborious, but this is something you can do actually in between the critique of student work. Uh, so typically my, my workshops are about two and a half hours or so, uh, sometimes three hours per day. And so we do one student manuscript for the first hour or 45 minutes. We do an in-class exercise um, in the middle. And then we do the second student um, during the second uh, or last hour or so, last 45 minutes. Um, so that's, these are the, some of the things. So the, the second thing that, that happens with these critiques, and again, is the, you, you have to really be very programmatic about uh, telling them what to focus on in these uh, critiques that they're doing of their students' work. Because they're, the, you know, the, the issue, I think, is, is always, a, and this is the not so obvious goal of this uh, critique, is that you have to work against the egoism of every writer. And what I mean by this is, although they, every student goes into the workshop um, so eager to get critiqued, to get uh, feedback on their own work, what is actually more important in the workshop is turning those writers into critics, turning those writers into people who are able to edit and look at work uh, in a very programmatic way so that they can turn that editing function onto their own work. And so this is... Um, this is the not so obvious goal of working against the egoism of the writer, that their critiques are actually more important for the writer and developing those critiques than the actual feedback and critique you yourself get on your manuscript. So you really want to turn them into better editors. And as I tell them at the very beginning, I say, you know, you get what you put into um, the workshop. Um, and so the, the third uh, aspect of, of what I do, yeah, this is again before we even start the workshop, is you, you have to be work to be very responsive as a teacher, uh, but also tough, because I think the way you um, begin a workshop really um, creates the atmosphere of, of working together. And so at the very first, uh, at the very first day, I pass out a set of rules, and I'll tell you what these rules are, are about and why uh, they start to meet some of the not-so-obvious goals of the, of the workshop. So the first thing I do, I, these rules, I'll read you some of them. Uh, for the author, I divide them between for the author and then also for the readers of the manuscript that we're critiquing. So for the author, I always, the first rule is after um, you read about five to ten minutes of your own work to the class out loud, um, you are put in an, an invisible isolation booth, and you're not allowed to talk as other people are talking about your work. And, and so uh, let me take those two in kind. Uh, the first reason I 
uh, tell uh, writers that I want to hear them is because this is how you start developing your voice um, by hearing yourself and the ear is a very different editor than the eye and so they have to get used to um, editing their work uh, first by simply looking at it and reading it but also editing your work by listening to themselves and so this um, this allows the class to to hear uh, who they are and the the part about the isolation booth is is that listening and absorbing people's critique is probably the most important aspect of the workshop and and sometimes that takes uh, weeks uh, to do even after the workshop is done because as as you know when you are uh, being workshopped it's a very emotional experience and it, and it can seem harsh but it also can be very practical and help you rewrite so the second rule I have for the author is that you can ask questions or make brief comments after your 45 minutes or so of being critiqued by your colleagues um, but you shouldn't explain your work explaining your, your work is really is sort of a waste of time whatever was on the page uh, or is not on the page is what should be discussed and uh, and you you know you don't ever have somebody uh, you know on your shoulder uh, telling you what a short story is about or, or an essay is about so it's really not not important to do that I think the third rule I have is that um, the verbal and the written critiques that a writer gets um, are going to be more meaningful weeks later uh, when you have some psychic distance from the workshop and remove your defensive emotions um, that's when you should attempt revision I think any writer that tells me oh I was critiqued last uh, yesterday and I'm, I've rewritten my piece uh, in my mind that will never really be a really great revision because revision is really almost starting from scratch and it takes some psychic distance and emotional distance to be able to do that and that's why I have uh, everybody write their critiques so that after you remove yourself from the hothouse of the of the workshop after you remove your emotions and um, you know you say you know Jose over here with his beady eyes you know gave me a really tough critique um, but then weeks later you can read Jose's comments and you can say you know gosh he was right you know he was right this story doesn't flow well and this that we have a problem with this character and and so that's when you start to rewrite fundamentally and so that's why it's very important to have every critique written down and not and not just and not, and not just uh, and not just uh, said in class um, the other thing the the fourth rule I have for the author before we start and I tell them this is that you are the ultimate decision maker of your work um, but your job is to listen and absorb comments and critiques um, and and let them resonate with you later because whatever resonates with you later will be probably right in terms of the vision of what you wanted to do with your story or your essay um, and um, and so let me give you a few of the rules for the readers and again I'll, all these things I pass out at the beginning of the workshop um, the first thing I tell the readers of the of the work that we're critiquing is that uh, they should read every essay or the story doesn't matter whether it's fiction or nonfiction they should read it first until the end and then reread it as an editor with starting to make margin comments starting to make uh, comments sentence by sentence uh, the rationale is of course you read it first as a reader and then you read it next as an editor and the other thing is um, the second rule I give to readers is of course um, focus your margin comments and your critiques of, on what's on the page never make your comments personal or about the author in any way and this is of course something you have to keep reminding them uh, at every workshop once we're in involved in, in the critiques that um, it's not about the politics of the writer it's not about the uh, the morality of, of what's happening with one character or not unless um, you know unless that's that's a, an, an extensive question in in the, in the actual piece um, it's really about whether the narrative flows well um, in uh, in this particular in this particular work um, and so one of the the third thing I, I asked the the readers to start with is um, I start with a general question 
I say, what do you think this work is really about? And what I'm trying to get to is the subtext, the subtext of the work we're, we're discussing, um, of the essay, of the short story. What is it really about? Is it really a, 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 a story about freedom or the lack of it? Is it really a story about um, not knowing who you are? Is it really a story about what? Because all of these macro comments, these, these quick uh, one or two sentence comments at the beginning of being critiqued, will help the writer understand if he got through the message or messages that um, that he or she was trying to get through in the work. And the other thing is you'll see the variety. You see the variety of reactions and as I said and as I uh, repeat to them often, you do not want uh, conformity. You don't you don't necessarily want everybody to react in the same way. Um, and so you have to keep reminding them that a, a work, whether it's an essay or whether it's a short story, it's like artwork. Um, you don't look at a piece of artwork uh, the same way, even the same person uh, during the same time. And the more you look at it, if it's a good piece of artwork, we'll have uh, many different interpretations of it. And so, it, so you have to keep reinforcing that, that you do not have to ape what your neighbors are saying about this character or about this plot or about the setting being realistic or not. Um, you can be very independent and you want to um, you know, say your piece in this critique as long as it's practical. And so this gets back to the not so obvious goals in, 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 my, in my workshop. Um, you have to fight against two trends in my mind. Uh, first, I think you want to remind them at all moments that you want true and exacting critiques. Uh, and that means uh, saying somebody, I like this piece, um, you know, and what a great writer you are. For me, that's pretty much pointless and useless. Uh, and, and you have to tell them that you really want to say what you truly believe of worked or didn't work about this piece. Um, and I usually, of course, always start with the positive um, to try to get, get them to say, tell me what did work, and then we get into the nitty gritty. And I also teach by the Socratic method. So I believe that everybody should talk. So if you haven't talked in a particular session, I will go after you and start asking you questions about uh, the characterizations of, of this piece to, to get what you really thought of, of the story or of this essay. Um, so that's the first thing. It's trying to avoid these bland uh, critiques or, or very sort of pat in the back uh, uh, affirmations that really don't help the writer at all. But the next thing is, and they, they know this too in my, in my workshop, that when you offer a critique, when you say this character doesn't ring true and it doesn't ring consistently and they give me a, a very good idea of why it doesn't, um, um, why it's problematic for them as a reader, uh, the next question I ask is how would you fix it? So it's always uh, a true critique trying to elicit true and honest and to the point critiques that are not personal, but also with a practical dimension. I expect all 11 of, of, uh, of my people in, in my workshop um, who are critiquing one author to also give me ideas, give the writer ideas who is listening um, on how to fix this problem, how to fix this particular problem that they may have pointed out. So um, you want to straddle um, you know, getting true critiques, getting honest critiques, and, it, and, and teasing them out by asking pointed questions to the people offering the critiques, but you also um, want to um, put them on the spot and say, how would you fix it? Give this writer ideas on how to rewrite this particular um, piece so that it solves the problem that you just pointed out. And so it also, you know, it forces them to um, to think a little bit more about why it is that they're having this problem and how they would uh, fix it, but it also gives the author who's listening all, all sorts of ideas on the rewrite. And, and again, you, all of this should be written down, all of this should be um, given to the writer um, in the written critiques that, that, that are turned in after every workshop. And, um, and so the writer can take all of these critiques plus practical solutions back home 
to her room and, and, and sit with it for a week or two, and then eventually start the fundamental rewrite based on what she th thinks are the best ideas for improving the story or improving this essay. Um, I think the other issue that, that I've sort of had faced um, and that you have to be very wary of your influence as a teacher. And again, this is a not so obvious goal. And what I mean by this is, is that I know that as soon as I give my critique of uh, the student in question for that particular workshop, that most other students uh, try to ape the teacher, try to copy what I'm saying simply because they want to please me. So I'm always the last to speak. Uh, when we're talking about a particular student work, I ask questions. I say, what do you mean that this, this character doesn't function or this plot is problematic or there's a grammar problem? I try to tease out uh, the critique and the practical solution to the critique, but I don't say myself whether I think it's right or wrong. I simply want them to, um, you know, to, to say their piece first. And by the way, this is the pedagogical function of what I'm doing. I'm Aristotelian. Um, for some of you who don't know, I have a graduate degree in philosophy at Yale. Um, and, and I was writing a dissertation on Aristotle, and I definitely believe in learning by doing. And this is John Dewey practice, um, you know, this, this philosophy as well. And so what I am doing in class is having them practice being critics. And true critics when some you know when sometimes you say things that 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 uh, are independent of everyone else but you may be right and I, my job as a teacher is to guide them to the right kind of questions uh, and to the right kind of practical applications to help the author at hand so I, that's why I always speak last or at least offer I, I I'm definitely peppering them with questions as each person is giving their critique just trying to elicit more practicality, more specificity uh, on each uh, critique. Um, but I don't actually say who I agreed with until the very end. Uh, and I think what, you know, what happens in my class is people really become great critics. And, and, and of, of course, what you want them to do is to be turning that critical function onto their own work. Um, and I think um, it, it has worked very well in my class. Um, you know, I think teaching them to be good critics is really allowing them, guiding them to be good critics. Um, the other thing, um, I think another not so obvious goal that, um, that, that I have is you have to be aware of the emotional impact on, of a critique on a writer, because all different writers uh, absorb uh, criticism in different ways. And so you have to be judging how this writer is taking his or her critique. And, and one of the things I tell my class uh, often is when we get into, into, into critiquing uh, different writers, different students, is that the more defensive a writer is, the less likely that writer will be to rewrite the work aggressively. And, and as, as I point out to them, that rewriting is better done after workshop. And my rule is, and I tell them this rule, I, I use it for myself, is that I don't rewrite anything that I just wrote. So uh, when we're critiquing an essay or a story in work, I, um, I tell them that take your written critiques home with you and work on something else. Create another story, create another essay, and then only after you've done that, after you've left the workshop, you go back to the, your written critiques that you did in my workshop, and then that's when you start rewriting that piece that we workshopped in class. And, and really the reason is you're trying to create this psychic emotional distance from what happened in the hothouse of the workshop. Um, you know, that's when you really will approach your own work as a true editor and make revision that starts from the ground up that is fundamental revision paragraph by paragraph and even completely jettisoning most of it and, and just getting a few great ideas from the first draft and creating a new draft. And that's, you know, that's when you start becoming a true editor of your own work. Um, and, and what I tell my class often is um, I became a better writer um, the, as soon as I got over myself. And so I tell them that's really what you have to do. You have to get over yourself. Uh, once you um, do that, 
you um, can become a better writer, a better editor of your own work. And that means getting over emotionally of somebody telling you the story didn't work, you spent hours on it, and yet you have to, to start from scratch or, or do it differently. Um, you have to not just have emotional distance, but uh, some sort of psychic distance, and, and really uh, approach your work uh, from scratch in many ways. Um, and so this absorbing of the critique emotionally, the isolation booth, uh, is as important uh, as sitting through a critique of your own work and listening, and really teaching them um, what, it is, what it means to really listen and absorb emotionally what people are telling you, and then not doing anything, and just letting it stay with you, and then what resonates with you a week or two later after your particular workshop will be actually what you should do in your, uh, in your rewrite. Um, so I think uh, one, one other um, thing that I um, am trying to create, the not so obvious goals, and is that really creating a literary environment in which the group is working in the service of the craft of writing. So it's really a goal, a group goal. Um, I, I tell them together, you know, you're stronger as writers if you learn and continue to work with each other and exchange work and edit each other's work and discuss it in this professional, truthful, critical, but also not personal way and what works and what doesn't and why. And, and I, I tell them, you know, which is true, I still have a couple of writers who always read my, my first drafts of, or really my second or third drafts of novels, and I do the same thing for them. And we give each other programmatic critiques, and it makes both writers uh, in this exchange much better. And so you, you go with someone at your level that, that will do that for you, and you're helping them and they're helping you. And it's, it's a good way to get that editing hat and to look at your own work in a new way. And that's, uh, of course, the whole point of the workshop, which they don't really realize until the end, that, that what happened was not that their feedback is great. They might have gotten great feedback and they know how to rewrite it. But what had become uh, a, a goal for them that they didn't know uh, I was trying to push for them is they've become really great critics of their own work and of other people's work. Um, and, 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 and I think this allows them in many ways to keep going and go faster than any workshop will uh, allow you to do. I think one of the last things I'll, I'll say, and then I'll sort of open it up for questions, um, and so people can ask me, you know, other, uh, on other issues, and is I also try to teach them to see in a new way. And, and this, you know, this may sound uh, odd, but I think we, we see our, the world around us, characters, uh, stories, etc., in a very cliche-ish way. Uh, and there are writers, uh, people like, for example, Barry Lopez on Nature, um, that is teaching writers how to see in a non-Western way, in a very fundamentally different way than subject-object. Um, and there's also another writer, Alexander Horowitz. And I assign, by the way, these works to my workshop to read in between and discuss in between manuscript critiques. Uh, Alexander Horowitz, for example, uh, took, it's a book called On Looking, and she uh, went around a Manhattan block 12 times with 12 different experts. And one of the experts was, I think, her five or seven-year-old son. Another expert was a geologist. Another uh, expert was a, a bug specialist, an architect, etc. And every single time around the same block, she noticed and found new things to, to uh, engage her and see. And so uh, I think as adults and as, as if you really want to be a professional writer, you have to be honing that intense curiosity and not assuming, oh, I've been around this block or, or I've met this person or I've, I've talked to Lydia and I know what she is. And, and you stop looking. You stop trying to uh, engage your empathy in a fundamental way every single time you meet someone else or every single time that you go around that block. And so you have to programmatically uh, encourage your own curiosity. And that's what Alexander Horowitz is doing is on looking. So uh, one of the goals of my workshop is also to be assigning these, um, these texts um, that not only are they critiquing each other's work, not only are they doing 
small exercises in class, take-home exercises that last two or three days. Uh, they're also reading these writers that I think are getting us away from uh, cliche-ish viewing uh, and cliche-ish writing and looking at things uh, from scratch. Uh, and so, so I think, uh, you know, I mean, I'll end with, with one sort of little tale. Um, I had a, uh, the last workshop I taught at Yale was sort of a very dramatic one. Um, a, um, uh, a writer, Catherine, I won't tell you her last name, but she had already published three books with New York publishers, but she had never published a, uh, a nonfiction work. And she said, I've, I had heard so much about your workshop, I wanted to take it. And one of the things she told me was that um, she was terminally ill. Uh, and so this would probably would probably be her last workshop. And she said, "I really wanted to take your workshop. It, it, it uh, you know, uh, I think you're, you're teaching things in in a very different way than any, anyone else." And so it was a lot of pressure. But I think it's that's the kind of pressure you should feel as a teacher, you know. And I felt it, and I, I you know, and I typically lose five to ten pounds uh, during every three-week period of a, of a workshop or two-week period of a workshop where we're meeting every day um, because I want to give them an experience that they will never forget that will teach them to look and write in a fundamentally different way than uh, they've ever done and so um, so uh, you know so I'd, I'd loved the challenge uh, and Catherine has become a great friend and we continue working on her pieces even though she's going through chemotherapy and a lot of other things but this is you know this is where meaning matters in my mind uh, this is where writing matters. Uh, this is when you're writing, you know, your last piece that will be left behind for you um, and will define who you are. And I think all of us should should be taking writing that seriously and that fundamentally. Uh, and it's not some sort of um, fun little enterprise. It really should be how you're going to pour out your soul or, or, or examine something from a fundamental way that no one else has done before. Uh, so anyway, with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, and I'll, I'll be happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sergio. Um, you know, I was just thinking that always when um, I listen to you, I'm always kind of listening um, or experiencing the talk through two lenses. And one is sort of through the lens of an aspiring writer. Um, and I can tell you that we have some published and aspiring writers um, on the webinar with us now. Um, and so, you know, hopefully we'll get some questions for you from them um, about, you know, writing practice and things like that. And then the other lens is always, you know, through that of thinking about as a teacher. Um, and how to apply some of these um, strategies and goals and best practices that you're talking about um, for a, a, a really different audience, in some ways a really different audience, in some ways a very similar audience. Um, so one of the questions that I have, I have two teachery questions. <laughs> okay. One is, I was really struck by when you were talking about um, that one of your uh, goals is just is about being aware of the emotional of the emotional impact on the writer of the criticism and um, I think that for me I was probably 24 years old when I finally learned how to take constructive criticism because <laughs> I was always that that writer that was like I'm a good writer um, I'm I don't I don't need feedback it's just good um, and then I had to fail to learn <laughs> that you know um, getting feedback from others is a really important part of the process and so I always try to communicate that to my students but the emotional impact of it um, is something that I'm thinking a lot about this year in particular and the question I have is how to teach really young like 19 20 year olds um, who are unpracticed writers but who are also very um, sensitive to the notion that they could fail in college, right? That they're that they don't belong and that college isn't made for them. And so how to teach that kind of student um, the idea or the practice of letting feedback sit with them for a little while before responding to it. Because I feel like or what I've seen actually is that the gut level response is that's it. She said it's bad. I failed. I'm dropping out. College isn't for me. 
<laughs> you know. Right. Well, I think the the first, I think, strategy in my mind would be to get them to write about that, about feeling that I do not belong, about mm. feeling uh, that, um, you know, college isn't for me. Why? Why it's not for me? Because first of all, it'll be a shared experience. Absolutely. Uh, the other students will understand. I feel that way too, or I've been there too. I've been there when when I didn't feel worthy, when I thought I was a fraud, when um, you know uh, people made fun of me. You know, when I was uh, coming from Isleta and I was this fat kid at the bookworm. And so, get them to write about that fear, because first of all, it'll create this little campfire in which all of you are writing about things that you don't want to talk about, or maybe you do to want to talk about. Um, and 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 they'll say, "All right, it's okay to write about this." So that, I think that's you know, find their greatest fears or their biggest questions about going from you know where they are to community college to four-year college and get them to write about that how does it feel when you're an outsider how does it feel when people around you just like when I was growing up in Isleta um, you know le reading books is not on the agenda um, uh, you know most people are making fun of you because you are more intellectual than they are why are you that way you're just born that way and so, so the, and then you, of course, you start the other thing I, I start doing. Uh, if this was the kind of audience that I was, I would look for um, essays and stories in which that is also being discussed by great writers, mm -hmm. uh, writers that they may recognize. So they'll say, "Oh, he went through that too," you know, and he, this is how he came out the other side. Um, he, you know, and there, there are many of them uh, right now. In fact, um, there's a. Uh, uh, an essay I wrote um, that just appeared uh, in an anthology called We Wear the Mask, 15 True Stories of Passing in America. And this is a, I wrote an essay for that anthology on, on basically feeling like a fake Harvard student uh, when I had been this poor kid from the border and, and how I got over that. And so I would, you know, for this, for this, uh, you know, for this uh, population, I would show them that essay and say, you know, this is how I sort of overcame that. Um, I think the other thing on on basically having them be patient is 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 just, you know, just trying to tell them why it will pay bigger dividends for them when they remove themselves um, from, you know, from from their own work and are able to. Uh, approach it in a much more aggressive editor uh, function, and 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 again, you know, if you're an 18 year old, a 19 year old, a 20 year old, there's a, always a variety in my mind because I I certainly have taught this population before, in terms of maturity, you know, some people are are you know are not going to get there even when they're 70. Um, I, I won't mention any names in terms of presidents, but. Um, there, there are some of us who will never get there from a, a, you know, be mature about their own lives. And some of some, I've met some very mature 18, 19 year olds who are able to understand that. Um, I'm, I'm trying to think of other strategies you can do. Um, I think that the, the first thing is to show them that it's okay to feel that you don't belong. And, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can't get there and, and, and showing them that, that, uh, there are ways to get there, and that other people have written about it will make them, I think, the, the very beginning feel not uh, not lonely about uh, writing about these topics. Thank you. Uh, yeah, another strategy that I've incorporated lately that just occurred to me as you were speaking is um, when we do peer review on essays, um, and then students revise, and then they turn that draft into me. Um, which is sort of my version of keeping myself out of it, you know, at first. Um, I have asked them at the beginning of the class that they turn the essay in, I've started giving them five questions that it will allow them to reflect on their revision process. And the last two questions are, how confident do you feel in this essay and what changes would you make if you had more time? And it's been really um, illustrative for me to see, first of all, most of them are not terribly confident in their essays. Um, and secondly, um, it, it helps guide my feedback to know 
in advance what they would change, you know, because then I can right. say, I think that your idea to add this or to take this out or to reorganize is a great one. Go with that, you know. And so it kind of empowers them that, oh, well, I already knew that before she even said it. So. Right. Now, I, I, let me just add one little thing because I found with very young students, like 19, 20 year olds, they're very techy. One of the things you can get them to do is get them to use this. Mm -hmm. um, record themselves reading their entire uh, story and then have them play it, you know, by themselves when they get home. Just read your essay uh, or story out loud, record it on your phone, and then listen to yourself. Um, and again, you're trying to create this psychic distance between you and, and your work. Listen to yourself and tell me what you hear. Tell me the issue you hear in terms of the dialogue, in terms of the narrative flow. Does it make sense to you when you hear yourself? Uh, you know, you can even give them a few questions to look at. Listen to yourself reading the story and, and see what you can tell me about your own story um, that, that you otherwise would not be able to tell me. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yeah, and, and you'd be surprised. You know, once they, 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 they have, are hearing themselves, they'll say, oh, this doesn't sound like the way someone would speak. I've heard that so many times. Mm -hmm. uh, and, 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 and that little trick will do it. Okay, good. And um, if anyone else has any questions, feel free to um, use the hand raise feature um, or type your question in, um, and I'll definitely uh, read it for you or unmute you to ask your question. Um, while we're waiting on other folks, I have one more question for you, um, and then I'll turn it over. And that is um, one of the things that we're doing now. So, Catch the Next program is ha has a literacy-based approach. So it's all founded on literacy on reading and writing um, as across disciplines. Um, but we're beginning to incorporate math into our program structure. And so I was wondering if you could speak to the question of how you see liter literacy relating to math acquisition or the acquisition of math mindsets and math success. Well, you, you know, I mean, the uh, math, I mean, I, I love math. Um, and I think when you're doing word problems, you have to be a very critical and specific reader. You have to really understand every single word and its relation to each other to get the, the math problem right when you're doing a, a word math problem. And so I, I wrote a story, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, uh, that, that appeared in, um, and you don't have a clue, uh, and, th and that you don't have a clue anthology, and it's meant for high school kids, in which th there's a mystery in the story. And um, in order to understand the mystery, you have to read this story really carefully, minutely. If you miss one little detail, you really won't solve the mystery. And at the end, of course, I tell you um, what the solution is. But it is, this is almost like a mathy, techy um, story in which um, I'm trying to teach students uh, to read um, very, very carefully. And, and so I think that's definitely applicable to math word problems. You have to read the word problem very carefully and understand what it is that they're asking you to do. And so, you know, this particular story uh, called Nuts, the name of the story is called Nuts, N-U-T-S. A high school kid attempts to kill a rival using the nut allergy of that rival. Um, and it's a mystery. Uh, but, but it's also a, a, it's a, a story about close reading. Uh, and as I tell uh, some students, you know, in philosophy, we would spend sometimes an entire semester on three paragraphs in Aristotle. Uh, that's close reading. Um, and so you have to, you know, I think that's the connection in my mind between math and between uh, literacy. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. I'm thinking about, too, I have a, a fifth grader who... Um, when we review his homework, it's always the word problems, and we'll sit there and we'll read it together, and he'll find the moment where he confused a word or confused the cause and effect or something like that because of not reading carefully. So, yeah, absolutely. I think that makes a lot of sense. Okay, we have a question now from Daniel Rodriguez. Go ahead, Dan. Hola, Sergio. How are you doing? Hi, Daniel. Hey, listen. Uh... I, uh, you mentioned something about losing weight and writing, and 
I think that might be a new twist into writing a book or something. That's something I haven't heard, you know, about losing weight in writing. <laughs> losing uh, weight? Yeah, and it, hey, I think you mentioned something about that, right? That during no, the writing. You no, know, but, but I could stand to lose a little weight. <laughs> Um, anyway, you said that that um, you know you read you read uh, till the end first, and then you come back and edit later. And sometimes um, I think as whenever we're reading or whenever we're editing or whenever we're working with a student, we tend to get right down to the uh, to the editing part. And uh, do you recommend that we wait? You know, just on on general papers that students are writing. I mean, do you recommend that we read the whole thing first and then and then edit later, or, or you know, or is it just only for those times that you're doing really critical uh, critical writing? You know, in my mind, you you are a better editor of your work if you've separated yourself from that work you're going to edit with another work in between. So if you uh, let's say so you do a short exercise of two or three pages for the student right. and then you you do another short exercise of two or three pages on a setting or a description you, you go back to the first one to to edit it after you have that other work in between done and so it, it separates you in and to become a better editor in my mind um, once you have something done in between you know the uh, the work you're going to edit I, if you're trying to edit something that you just wrote, you're probably not going to be a very good editor of it. That's, That's it. what I'm trying to say. So, so, so the, I think the key for a teacher would be to to have shorter works, um, you know, one, two, three pages um, that um, that you can that you can complete, and that way you'll have a series of works, and you can edit a first work earlier. Um, and descriptive exercises are great, like having them uh, say describe this room uh, as if a, you know a murder just took place, or describe this room because this uh, from the point of view of someone who just lost their girlfriend or boyfriend, um, or describe this room. You know, these these can be little exercises, one or two page exercises, which shows them to describe for a purpose. And then you do something else, and then you go back to that descriptive exercise to, um, you know, to to rewrite it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, that that, that makes good sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. Very good sense. Very good. Yeah, I love that. And then we have a comment here from uh, Juan Ochoa. Uh, who comes to us from South Texas College. He says, this is all very good advice. I can't stress enough to my students that the only good writing is rewriting. I have a laid back style and I like to joke and sometimes my students get upset because they feel I'm mocking them. But I explain that the other option is to take things too seriously and risk the rise of defensive walls that keep out all reason. I'm going to take to heart the part where we should wait a couple of weeks to let the feedback set in and detach myself from emotion and look at my own work critically. But I might just be looking for an excuse to procrastinate. <laughs> Gracias, Sergio. <laughs> I have to say, I was actually thinking the same thing um, because I'm. Uh, I, it takes me forever to grade, and so. Um, I'm like, yeah, I, I'm just giving them the time away from their work, right, to reflect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, I mean, the other thing is just simply, you know, I mean, I, 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 th I think I kind of loosen up. I start out looking very serious, but I'm not uh, by the end of the workshop. But I want them to get the work done. You know, <laughs> for me, it's all about the work. Absolutely. Um, are there any other questions out there? And thank you, Juan, for Hi. your comment. Yeah, uh, Sergio, thank you. This has been really uh, insightful. I have a question for you. This is Maria Marta. Hi, um, Maria. What can what can our teachers do to motivate students that are beginners in the uh, language arts in English? And what did your teachers do to really get you to dream? that you could go to Harvard and, and succeed as a writer? Well, no one told me to go to Harvard, first of all, um, because no, no one even knew what Harvard was. Um, but, but no, honestly, they just, I think I was the first uh, person in my high school ever to go. Um, but I'll tell you what made uh, a difference in terms of writing. 
So when I was in high school, I had this great teacher named Pearl Crouch, who was a journalism teacher at East Letter High School. And when I started writing stories for her, I started writing edgy stories about sex in high school students, about um, you know teachers uh, manipulating and being abusive to students, you know stuff that they did not want in the high school paper, um, especially the administration. But Pearl Crouch defended me. She said, you know, as long as you're writing something truthful, even if it's edgy, even if it's um, not welcomed by the teachers, um, I don't care. I think we, we're going to, you know, we're, she would fight these battles with the principal to get me to print these stories, as long as I could prove my facts. Um, but it, it showed me that writing mattered. So getting them to write about their real problems, the real issues, not propaganda, not what will look good in an essay, but the real issues that they are facing in their in their life, uh, whether it's uh, you know um, awful, difficult issues, um, you know, in the family, uh, legal issues. Uh, what you're telling them is your writing matters, your voice matters, what you want to say matters. And so that's what it did for me for, with Pearl Crouch. She, you know, she she would defend me and encourage me to write about things that, of course, she didn't know a lot about. But she would defend my right to write it, and and I think that made such a difference in my life. I, um, you know, I, I I understood that writing could be very powerful, especially when when adults would get pissed off about what I was writing. Um, and and this was here here was my journalism advisor going tooth toe to toe with the principals you know who was trying to kick me out saying you know what he's writing is truthful the problem is you have problems in your high school and you ha I have an editor who's writing about them you know why don't you fix those problems instead of attacking my editor and that just showed me that my writing mattered and so I think that's Maria Marta that's I think what you should be telling your students write about not the propaganda not the nicey things that, you know, if you want to write about sex, if you want to write about, uh, you know, illegal things uh, that, that are happening, you know, around you, uh, you know, whatever is burning in your heart, encourage them to do that. Encourage them to, to, to put it on the page because I think it'll have a profound effect on them. Excellent. Thank you. So I, I, I hope that makes sense. It does, definitely. Um, we want them to be able to write about, you know, their life and what they see. Uh, and I do think that's a great point that we need to encourage them to be really courageous and to uh, discuss their reality, uh, which I think oftentimes we do not um, do as much of as we should. Um, so thank you, Sergio. I know this has been a really uh, wonderful experience for me and everybody else. We really appreciate all that you have done for our program over the last five years. You are always there when we need you. You have Skype sessions with the kids from El Paso and you've done others at other institutions. And, you know, we recognize that uh, it takes a, a special person to be able to do that. So we are, um, we feel privileged to have you as one of our author mentors and uh, hopefully more of the colleges are able to uh, have you go and visit them in the future. So thanks again. Well, thank you very much, Maria Marta. And thank you, Sergio. Um, uh, this has been really illuminating. And um, you know, feel free to get in touch with us if you need anything from us, absolutely. And um, I'm sure I will be in touch with you again soon. OK, take care. You too. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 OK.